Read by Dale Grothman. Some dames are bright, some brighter, like the gorgeous wife of the playboy Kamish, who combined all the stellar attributes necessary to slice in two parts an ultra modern spaceship and a marriage with one swoop of a clock hand. The Luminous Blonde by Hayden Howard. As the frilly bloused Rocket bent over him to unbuckle his safety corset, newly appointed Commissioner for Economics for Mars, J. Edwin Elbert peeked. But her fingernails tatted so hastily at the buckle that he raised his surprisingly useful blue eyes to her face. She was blushing there, too. A pretty little baby face. Skillfully, he swallowed a rising belch that was a natural consequence of the cessation of gravity upon a paunch overbloated with farewell champagne, Venus dipped cold crab, and two sweet apricot bread. Director Huggins is to be congratulated upon his choice of rockets, he rumbled, sneaking his fat, grossly manicured fingers about her wrist. The click of the powder room door would warn him of his wife's return. Just the other day I was saying to him that the new Bolo II should have only the best. I see he has exceeded even my hopeful expectations. Tell me, my dear, when does the Bolo go into Huggins' celebrated centigrav? This weightlessness is rather unsettling to one's stomach. Can I get you a Dramamine pill, sir? No, thank you. When does... Oh, at nineteen hundred hours, she gushed. The ship splits in half, she added helpfully, and dimpled in the winning way of little girls who will never grow up. Remarkable. They tell me some sort of cable will tie us together. Yes, sir, when we are far enough out in space so that there isn't any air friction. Mr. Webley, the pilot, pulls a little lever and the nose flies off. He'll be all alone out there for forty-two days. And only a thin cable connects our passenger section to his control section? He was quite familiar with the details, since he had lobbied for the initial appropriation. Her forearm had a nice, warm, smooth feeling. Oh, you understand it perfectly, sir. When we're a mile apart, the little rocket at the side makes us spin around and around. Then I can take off these old iron shoes. She followed his gaze to her legs and tittered. He speculated that similar magnets must be holding down the hem of her nylon skirt. And does the spinning about a common access continue until we're near Mars? Yes, sir, for forty-two days. Excuse me, sir, I think no gravity is making that lady ill. After carefully wiping his palm on his coat sleeve, he replaced his unlit cigar in his broad, gleaming face. He was in the smiling sensuality of a daydream when the powder room door clicked. His wife was beautiful. Untilting his cigar, he watched her drift down the aisle. With one scarlet-tipped finger, she prevented her diaphanous skirt from floating very high above her knees. A lovely lady. He clamped on the cigar. It's not every man whose wife is a natural blonde, ex-starlet, young enough to be his daughter. But a little discipline was in order. Landa, I wish you had remembered to have Hikado pack my golf things. Edwin, please, this no gravity is upsetting my tummy. Well, it's the least you could have done. And how would we have gotten on the ship? Her voice shrilled unexpectedly. You embarrassed me enough as it was. Listen, I'm the commissioner. No two-bit pilot is going to tell me what I can't take. The luggage limit is ridiculous. What are you complaining about? He let you take everything, didn't he? After you smiled at him. I was only trying to be pleasant. Pleasant, is it? Last time you said it was to influence him to take all my luggage. Yeah, and you got sore because you weren't a big enough shot to swing the deal alone. Her voice rasped through its ladylike veneer. That's a lie. Furthermore, I don't want to catch you smiling at him again. 
I give up, she exclaimed, and reached for a telemag. But he wouldn't drop it there. I don't like that fellow's looks. Pads in his shoulders, little waxed mustache. Who does he think he is, Captain Future? Oh, don't be funny. Just think what he thinks of you after what you said to him in front of all the other passengers and crew. Taking his side now? I am not. She gave a little sniff and fumbled for her handkerchief. You're so mean and masterful, I'm surprised you don't make me go up front and tell him what a sap he is. He was a sap, smiling at my wife, all right. He uplifted his cigar with a modified grin. He wasted a smile there. Two-bit pilot. Who does he think he is? He did smile at me, though, she appended in a small voice. His voice snapped out again, and you smiled back. He ground his unlit cigar into the ashtray. I think you were just now trying to flatter me. I think you were trying to turn me off the track when you said you'd go up and tell him what a sappy is. I was not. Don't try to wiggle out of it. That's what you said. All right. If you think I should, I will. Well, now. He paused, smiling, and carefully trimmed the crushed end of his cigar with a gold-plated cigar cutter before he continued. If you insist, go ahead. There's not much time left, she said, pointing at the neon-dialed clock above the powder room door. Beneath it hung an orange, luminescent sign, U.S. Eastern Standard Earth Time Equivalent. Eighteen fifty hours, he snorted. Don't try to wiggle out on that account. You have a half an hour. Okay, if you say so, she shrugged and chewed the inside of her cheek. This isn't very nice. Let's not get that way. You coolly slipped the shaft in me enough. And stop powdering your nose. Without another word, she rose and floated down the aisle, taking little care to suppress her skirt. Somebody whistled and the commissioner angrily craned his thick neck around. He couldn't see who had done it, but he suspected the three grinning cadet astronauts in the last row of seats. She rose and floated down the aisle, taking little care to suppress her rising, diaphanous skirt. As the door to the control room clanged shut, the powder room door clicked open, and the rocket tapped out on her iron shoe soles. Commissioner Elbert rolled his eyes and smiled, but she seemed preoccupied with a smaller female with pigtails and hiccups. Guess I'll have to look forward myself, he thought, just like a woman to go up there, wait in the hall a minute, and come back. Rising, he floated past the rocket toward the control room door. Don't open that, sir. The ship's about to separate. What? It's only 1855 hours. That is Eastern Standard Time, sir. The clock at the other end of the aisle, over the men's room, gives the standard star time our ship's schedule operates on. Those neon hands pointed to 1900. With a strangled yell, he lunged for the door, but as his hands closed around the handle, something clicked, and it resisted his straining, and then his pounding fists. A buzzer sounded, and a cheery, masculine voice spoke over the intercom. Hello again, passengers. This is your pilot, Hugh Webley, wishing you a pleasant crossing. Please re-enter your safety corsets. The Bolo II will now separate. Intercom, the commissioner shouted. Shoving past the slack-jawed rocket, he literally swam down the gravityless aisle to the engineering hatchway. It opened to his shouts. Yeah, a giant with a handlebar mustache peered at him. I'm Commissioner Elbert. Call your pilot at once. I ordered the ship not to separate. Hastily, the giant lifted the phone. Commissioner Elbert could hear the steady buzz. Sorry, sir, Webley's cut us off. He does that so no one will interrupt him while he's setting the auto controls. Get him somehow. My wife's up there. The giant coughed and strangled and turned his face away. 
I'll keep trying, sir, he gasped. But sometimes he cuts us off for days. He sleeps a lot. Forehatch, the commissioner shouted suddenly. Unlock the forehatch. Wearily, the giant clambered up. He towered over Elbert. Didn't you hear what I said? the commissioner yelled. Unlock the door to the control room. Sorry, sir, the lock's automatic. Well, damn it, blast it down. Noisily, the giant scratched his crew cut. Maybe I could crowbar it. Quick, you fool. No, I can't. I can't, sir. The ship might separate while the hatch was open, and our own air pressure would blow us all into the vacuum. I can't risk the lives of the passengers, sir. I'm Commissioner Elbert. Give me that crowbar. The giant held it behind him. That's an order. Sorry, sir. Better reclaim your seat before the jolt. The giant signaled with his fingers at the rocket. Elbert snatched at the crowbar. As the two men grappled for it, whirling like fighting cocks in the air, a tremendous surge hurled them the length of the aisle. Another slammed them against the powder room door. When the giant helped the bleeding commissioner to his feet, artificial gravity held them down. Emitting motherly sounds, the rock cat tried to wipe the blood from his forehead, but he shoved her aside. I'll sue. I'll have your transportation license revoked. Please, sir, the rocket squealed. I'll bring you a sedative. Huggins will hear about this, he shouted, writhing at the engineer's brawny arms. But then he sobbed. I sent her up there. My fault. My idea. She didn't want to go. She was worried about the time, and I told her there was plenty of time. As he gulped the sedative, he looked like a punctured balloon. I don't want a sedative, he shouted, but he had just swallowed it. He sagged again. My fault. I told her there was plenty of time. He rubbed his sleeve across his nose. After they had settled him groggily in his seat, the rocket drew the engineer aside. Her pretty little brow wrinkled. Dan, I can't figure it. Why does he think it's his fault? Gee, when we were in the powder room together, she asked me about why the clocks told different times, and I explained how we figure time by position of the stars, instead of earth and sun and all that stuff. You'd think she understood. She talked bright enough. The giant squeezed her arm affectionately. Lucky Webley, sap commissioner, bright dame, forty-two days, and an alibi. He chuckled and walked his finger up her arm. Carol, you can't even tell. All dames don't have the same amount of brightness you do. She giggled and shivered a little at his hand. We learned all about time in Rocket School. The End of the Luminous Blonde by Hayden Howard